In 1797, the tomb of King John, which is set in front of the high altar of Worcester Cathedral, was opened, and his mortal remains and some interesting grave goods were revealed. In this video, I'm not just going to tell you about what was found inside the tomb, which would be rather boring. I'm also going to explore more deeply the circumstances of John's death, the peculiar and unusual characteristics of his tomb, and why he was buried in Worcester, which is not an obvious place for an English king to be buried. To understand the circumstances of John's death, I really must begin by outlining something of John's life, at least in broad terms. I could do several videos on his life. John is the English medieval king that everyone loves to hate, but I can't help but have a little bit of sympathy for him. Tell me what you think. Do you have sympathy for John? When he was born, he was the ultimate spare rather than the heir. He was the fifth son, the fourth to survive to adulthood, of King Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. He was from birth never expected to inherit any estates or lands, let alone a kingdom, and he was cruelly nicknamed by his father Henry, never known for his subtlety, as John Lackland. It seemed unlikely, given his many brothers, that he would ever inherit his father's throne. He was born into a frankly dysfunctional family, often at open war with one another, and he was also constantly under the shadow of his better-looking, swashbuckling brother, Richard the Lionheart. It can't have been easy to be born at the bottom of the heap in the Plantagenet family. In 1199, when Richard I died and John inherited England and the empire his father created, the empire was already tottering and failing. He inherited a whole raft of problems, rebellion in France and rebellion in England, and he fought fires on many fronts. He did what many English kings unprepared to rule defaulted to, that which was to fall into a form of despotism, and that, mixed with a fiery personality inherited from his father, made him a man who was without much charm and was unprepared to compromise politically. I think historians are gradually coming around to a more sympathetic view of John, and there is a lot of evidence that he was very able in many other ways. He was a good administrator and a brave military leader, but the odds were stacked against him given the complexities of his inheritance. Ruling an empire on both sides of the channel, as his father found, was simply impossible single-handedly. The last couple of years of John's life were terrible. He had effectively lost Normandy in 1204, and the loss was in truth inevitable. In 1214, he attempted to reconquer, but he failed. Returning to England at the end of 1214, after this failed campaign, he faced open rebellion from many of his barons. Not helped by his uncompromising Plantagenet temperament, the resulting tensions led to John being forced in June of 1215 to agree to the terms of political reform and a Magna Carta. The Magna Carta led to a short-term and uneasy peace that quickly gave way that year to an outright war with the barons, who backed up by an invading force provided by the French king were keen to overthrow John. The final two years of John's life were spent constantly on the move and in conflict with his barons, and it must have been an exhausting way to live. During the later summer of 1216, John moved north against the rebel barons and made his way towards Lincoln, which was a stronghold that was loyal to him, but was besieged. Having spent some days relieving Lincoln, in September he then retreated back to King's Lynn in Norfolk, a town loyal to him where he could be resupplied. During this time in King's Lynn, he appeared to have contracted dysentery, a disease common among soldiers on the move. However, the now sick king decided to press on north from King's Lynn, crossing Lincolnshire once again, making his way across the boggy fens around the Wash. And it was during this journey across this treacherous ground that part of his baggage train was lost, his household goods. The king had with him his crown, his state crown, and some of the crown jewels. Kings always took their state crowns, their great crowns with them. And some sources claim that these were sucked down into the boggy fens and were lost forever. Exhausted, the king and his retinue eventually arrived at Newark on the River Trent, where they were housed at Newark Castle. Newark Castle, overlooking the Trent, was not a royal possession, but a palace of the bishops of Lincoln. It was at Newark 
During the night of the 18th or 19th of October, the sources differ, of 1216, that King John died. He was 49. Although dysentery is the likely reason for his demise, tradition circulated fairly soon that he'd been poisoned or that he'd died from eating too many peaches. Every schoolboy knows that King John died of a surfeit of peaches. King John made a short and hurried will in the days before his death, a copy of which survives in Worcester Cathedral. It is a document no bigger than a postcard. On the day before his death, the end looking very likely, the abbot of the Premonstratensian Abbey of Croxton in Leicestershire, some 20 miles directly south of Newark, was called to the king's bedside. Abbot Adam of Croxton was a renowned physician, but it was too late. After John died, his body was eviscerated, as was common practice at the time, in order to prepare it for its long journey to its burial place. And Abbot Adam returned to his abbey at Croxton, taking with him King John's viscera, including the king's heart, which he buried before the high altar of the abbey. Some say that the viscera were buried on a hill called Windmill Hill near Croxton Abbey, but that sounds rather implausible to me. There is absolutely nothing left of Croxton Abbey now, though the lumps and bumps of it can be seen on the lidar, and we know the church's position, and it's quite likely that John's heart and his innards still lie today beneath the Leicestershire grass close to these ponds. In his will, John was very clear about where the rest of his mortal remains should lie. I desire, he writes, that my body be buried in the church of St Mary and St Wolfston at Worcester, what we know today as Worcester Cathedral. So why did he choose to be buried in Worcester? Well, the choice of burial place for English kings was not fixed in this period. His father and brother Richard were buried at Fontevraud Abbey in Aquitaine. King Stephen had been buried in Faversham Abbey in Kent. Henry I in Reading Abbey in Berkshire, which he had founded. William Rufus in Winchester Cathedral, the place of burial of many Saxon kings. And William the Conqueror, of course, in Rouen. It was only John's son, Henry III, who fixed Westminster Abbey as the English royal mausoleum. It has been suggested that John initially wanted to be buried at Bewley Abbey in Hampshire, a monastery he had founded. But in 1216, that was impossible, and Worcester was chosen because it was out of rebel hands. He could argue that the choice of Worcester was for personal reasons too, the end of 1214, the year he lost France for good, John spent Christmas at Worcester. He arrived on the 24th of December and remained there until the 27th, spending Christmas and holding court in the city in the now lost castle beside the cathedral. During his stay, he was received solemnly by the monks of the cathedral priory and he is said to have knelt in prayer at the tomb of St Wolfstan in the church, the last surviving Anglo-Saxon bishop of the English church. This likely left a lasting impression on him, and he seems to have developed a devotion to the saint. This Christmas, this last settled Christmas of his reign, was most likely a happy interlude for John between the disaster of the French campaign and the impending Barons' War. Perhaps a combination of devotion and happy memories motivated his request to be buried here. John was brought to Worcester and he was initially buried in the cathedral that St Wolfstan had constructed in the 1080s between the tombs of Wolfstan himself and his saintly predecessor from the 10th century, St Oswald. Little of the church John was buried in now survives except for the cathedral crypt below it. John was probably buried where his tomb stands now, in the choir before the high altar, but back in 1216, that spot was in a different location within the geography of the Norman church. At that time, that particular spot was directly behind rather than in front of the high altar of the cathedral and was in an ambulatory, a walkway with chapels that ran around the apsidal, round-headed east end of the cathedral. The central chapel where he was laid was probably dedicated to Mary. It was a lady chapel. And such ambulatories of Norman churches were a common burial place of bishops and significant people. 
The cathedral around John's burial place was completely reconstructed a few years after his death. The apse of St Wollstone's Church and its choir was demolished and a new east end was constructed between 1224 and 1269. The whole of the church was extended eastwards considerably and John's tomb, although never moved, ended up being sited in front of rather than behind the high altar. So his remains move from a less prominent hidden spot to centre stage in the 1220s and 1230s. The present monument to the king contains elements of the original monument erected by John's son Henry III in the 1230s, but it's been altered in the 1520s as we will see. Henry III, who inherited the throne as a child amidst the continuing Barons' War, waited a good few years until he came of age before installing a proper tomb at his father's grave, and it was probably planned as an integral part of the new construction work at Worcester, which Henry also financed. The tomb was completed in 1232, and Henry III was present when the choir containing it was consecrated. Before that reconstruction work and that new tomb was provided, King John was probably buried in a stone coffin set into the floor with a simple flat lid over the top of it. The effigy on top of the present tomb is the monument that Henry erected to his father. The effigy is carved on a tapered coffin-shaped stone and it was in essence simply a replacement lid for the existing stone coffin John was buried in. The effigy shows the king in his royal robes, crowned and holding a sword, and perhaps the remains of a sceptre in one hand. His feet rest on a lion of chivalry and his head is on a cushion, and on either side of him are two figures of bishops holding incense censers in their hands as though they're sensing the king. These are probably St Wolfston and St Oswald, between whom the king was buried. The effigy is made of Purbeck marble from Dorset and there's evidence that it was once very richly coloured. We know that this effigy was originally covered over too by some sort of grill, but this has not survived. John's tomb, the earliest surviving tomb in England to an English king, was not all that elaborate or grand when first created. It was not much different than the tombs of other members of the social elite in England at the time. To get some indication of how this tomb would have appeared, the best place to go is to the Temple Church in London, where the tombs of the Templars and of William Marshall, John's contemporary, are similar sculptured coffin lids that are laid directly on the floor and were over stone coffins. The tomb of John is, of course, much grander now as it was updated in the 16th century. The tomb chest on which the effigy lies of Perbe marble, topped with a black marble slab, Um, dates, if the antiquary John Leland is to be believed, from 1529. Now just a stone's throw in the cathedral from John's tomb is the Chantry Chapel and tomb of Arthur, Prince of Wales, the eldest son of King Henry VII. He died in 1502, but his chantry and his tomb were completed in 1516 by his brother Henry VIII. Now the tomb chest of Arthur and that of King John are almost identical in form and material Perbet marble with a black marble top, with tracery sides with shields, and the tomb was likely commissioned by Henry VIII too. John was, after all, his ancestor. In 1529, when the monument was updated, the coffin of King John under his original effigy was opened, and the king's remains were revealed. One eyewitness to this event was a former Carmelite friar and bishop of Ossory called John Bale, who had written a historical play about the king and was really interested in his life. In the margin of his personal copy of Trevitt's Annals of the Kings of England, Bale made a handwritten record of the opening in 1529. The remains of the king, Bale says, were dressed in state. He had a crown on his head, a sword at his side, His right hand was holding a rod, his left hand a scepter, he had spurs on his feet and a ring on his finger. He was dressed as a king should be. In 1529 his body was left on display for two days before being replaced in the newly constructed tomb and it seems that during this time many of the grave goods were removed 
or stolen. Okay, so it's now time for the bit you've all been waiting for. In 1797, unaware of the 1529 opening, it was decided to open the tomb again in order to settle a dispute. Now, not understanding that John's grave had never actually been moved, but that the architectural setting around him had changed, some antiquaries in Worcester were arguing that the tomb was only a cenotaph and that John wasn't buried in it, but was still buried in a grave in the Lady Chapel behind the high altar. Actually, that part of the building didn't exist in 1216, and had John been buried there, he would have been buried outside. The tomb was therefore opened on the 17th of July 1797, and an account of the opening, including an engraving of the inside of John's coffin, was published by a London engraver and antiquary and former Worcester resident called Valentine Green. When the effigy and top black stone was removed from the tomb chest, the coffin of the king was found to be within the tomb chest, although it was placed at the very bottom of the chest, resting on the floor of the choir. The coffin was initially obscured by brick and mortar debris that was filling the upper part of the chest, and on top of the coffin, protecting the remains from the brick and mortar debris, was a form of timber planking. Uh, to stop the rubble infill falling into the coffin. Even so, some of that had rotted away and some of the rubble was within the coffin itself. The coffin itself was clearly the original. It differed entirely in material to the tomb chest and effigy. It was made of local highly sandstone, the same building material as the cathedral itself. The remains of King John were skeletal, but there was clear evidence that the body had been dressed in a robe that reached from the neck to the feet. The robe was seemingly of crimson damask, decorated with embroidery, but was highly discoloured. A piece of this royal robe was taken out in 1797 and has been preserved in the Cathedral Library, and it seems to show a gold lion passant or a leopard, which was, of course, the royal arms adopted by the Plantagenets. The only item from the grave goods seen in 1529 to survive was the king's sword, which was in a leather scabbard by his left arm. The sword itself was very badly decayed, but the leather scabbard was less so. Green recalls that the legs of the king had a sort of ornamental covering tied around the ankles, and over the feet. He wasn't sure at the time if this was fabric or leather. These are probably what are termed buskins, which were part of the traditional garb of the sovereign at coronations, and the king is shown wearing buskins on his effigy. They are tied around the ankle to keep them on. On the king's head was found a sort of cap that was tied under his head, and his skull had rolled back from this to show the neck. In 1797, this head covering was assumed to be a monk's cowl and that the king had been buried simply and with humility. They weren't aware at the time of the 1529 evidence that the king had been buried in full funeral regalia. It isn't a monk's cowl, which would not have been strapped under the chin. It is rather a typical object of civilian dress in this period called a coif that covered the hair. Such a coif was part of the coronation regalia, Medieval English kings wore a coif after they'd been anointed with holy oil, and they wore the crown on top of the coif. As well as being a required part of the coronation regalia, a coif was also one of the items required for the burial of the king, according to the 14th century English royal funeral instructions, De Exequis Regalibus. The king's remains were found to be covered with a vast quantity of dry skins of maggots, perhaps suggesting that the seal of the original coffin lid was not perfect. When measured, Green came to the conclusion that the king was five foot six tall. Now, the king's lower jaw had become separated from the skull and it was found further down in the coffin. The lower jaw had no teeth. The upper had only four. There appeared to be some evidence that the king's teeth had been removed post-mortem. And this brings us to some curious relics now in the collection of the cathedral. A couple of teeth and a thumb bone. These are said to be King John's and to have been removed in 1797. Well, they were not removed by Valentine Green or his fellow scholars. When the tomb was opened in 1797, the local populace got wind of this 
and came to the cathedral wanting to have a look, and the tomb was left exposed as it had been in 1529 for people to see. The crowd was so great that in the end, the dean and chapter had to stop people coming in and close the tomb up the very next day. For one or two people, curiosity got the better of them, and through their desire to have a relic of the much maligned king, they desecrated the remains, and that is how the two teeth and bone appear to have escaped. Now, during my research for this video, I came across a lot that had been sold at Christie's, in 1998, which is also seemingly connected with the 1797 opening. I haven't been able to find a photo of it, but it is apparently a gilt-led figure of Christ from a crucifix, and according to the catalogue entry, it was late 12th or early 13th century. It was sold in 1998 for £11,500. At the time of the sale, it was mounted on a piece of vellum with an inscription in a late 18th century hand claiming that the little figure had come from the coffin of King John and stated that the piece had been given to Lord Henry Somerset, Marquess of Worcester, when he was six. This is presumably the man who in time became the seventh Duke of Beaufort. He was six in 1798. He was, of course, a descendant of King John. This item, which we can assume was a personal devotional item of the king, is not mentioned in either Bale or in Green's account of the opening. So, did someone in 1797 just spot it and take it away as a souvenir? We will never know, but given things were not spotted and even bits of the king's anatomy were removed, it appears that the 1797 opening was a very chaotic affair indeed. King John, despite a disastrous reign and an ignoble end, was originally buried in full state in Worcester, dressed as at his coronation, as depicted on his effigy, in fact, in a gorgeous embroidered robe of royal crimson, with the trappings of his sovereignty, a crown, scepter, sword, coif and buskins. However, he was also buried, it seems, with this tantalising item of personal devotion, a cross, perhaps worn around his neck, and he was laid in Worcester Cathedral, among the saints. Thanks for watching. I have some copies left of January's issue of The Antiquary magazine. The Antiquary is a beautiful publication printed each month in full colour. People have remarked that it's like receiving a coffee table book in miniature every month. Broad in its historical subject matter, this month I take readers on a tour of the Norman sculpture at Kilpack Church in Herefordshire. I look at the uncompleted monument and the grave of King Edward IV at Windsor and explore the origin of the word hearse and the towering candle-filled structures of that name used at funerals in medieval Europe. Why not get a copy or even subscribe? Subscriptions help me continue to bring you more interesting content on this channel.